get rid of it. Okay, so now let, let's let's talk about circuit verification in the next parts. These next parts are going to be uh, interesting and easier and more practical from your lab perspective because in your labs you'll have to deal with verifying your circuits. And the key question in circuit verification is how do you know that a circuit works? Uh, you have designed a circuit. Is it functionally correct? That's the first question. Even if it's function functional correctness is the same as logical correctness, basically. Even if it's functionally or logically correct, does the hardware meet all of the timing constraints? Now, the question is, of course, how do we do this verification? How can we test for functionality and timing? And the main answer that we're going to use in this course is really simulation tools. So Vivado, for example, in this course is going to be your friend to enable functional verification, timing verification. Uh, you could also do a circuit level simulation at the lower level, like SPICE is another tool for circuit level simulation. You're not going to deal with over here. If you take a microelectronics design class, for example, you will deal with SPICE. Or you could formally verify a circuit. This is especially true for functionality. Uh, timing is much harder, but you could use, for example, satisfiably, test, satisfiably t -t -t testing solvers, SAT solvers, in other words, or formal verification tools, other similar form of verification tools to formally verify that your circuit actually does what it's intended to do. And we're not going to talk about that. Also, again, if you take a formal verification class, they may cover hardware design because some of these formal verification tools are applied to hardware also. But in this class, we're going to talk about simulation tools uh, quite a bit. So uh, this brings us to testing large digital designs. So testing, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, can be the most time consuming design stage. You need to ensure functional correctness of all logic paths. You need to ensure timing, power, et cetera, uh, of all circuit elements, they're within the bounds and they're correct. Unfortunately, low-level simulation is much slower than high-level simulation. So circuit-level simulation, spice simulation is much slower than Vivado or C-level simulation. So basically, we normally split responsibilities in this. We usually check functionality only at a high level, like C or hardware description language, because this allows us to do simulate fast with high co code coverage. And we can easily write and run tests at that high level of abstraction because things are much faster. Whereas if you do it at a circuit level, things are much slower. Uh, and also you need to be more detailed in the modeling, which makes the modeling slower also uh, to begin with. Uh, and also we check uh, only timing, power, et cetera, at a lower level or circuit level. And we usually don't do functional testing, uh, whether, you, whether the circuit implements this function at a, using a low level model. But we test the functional equivalence to the high level model. So if you have a circuit model, is it really equivalent to the higher level model? Now this is hard, but easier than testing logical functionality at that level. Again, I'm not gonna go through the details of this. Your book actually has more uh, detail uh, and some other books have even more detail. Uh, so we have tools to handle different levels of verification. Uh, logic synthesis tools guarantee equivalence of high level logic and synthesized circuit level description. So basically you write in hardware description language, you give it to a tool, that synthesizes the hardware description language. And hopefully somebody verified it formally or uh, in some, with some other testing methods that it's guaranteed to be correct. That's what you're relying on over there. Timing verification tools check circuit timings. And uh, sometimes your synthesis tools actually do that also. Uh, in fact, you will see that they will, uh, but they may not be perfect in this case. Uh, and then there's design rule checks uh, that ensure that physical circuits are build buildable. This is basically, uh, whether the transistors are too close to each other, for example, whether the gates are too close to each other, whether you make sure that the wires are large enough uh, to carry the load that they're subjected to. Clearly, we're not, at that, we're not at that level in this course. This is at a lower level than what we're going to cover in this course. So we're not going to go and talk about design rule checks. But the task of a logic designer is to provide functional tests for logical correctness of the design and to provide timing constraints, or for example, the desired operating frequency, uh, to make sure that the design actually works, right? Uh, and also you need to somehow make, make sure that the hold time constraints are not violated, right? That's also the task of a logic designer, unfortunately, as we have seen earlier. Uh, so basically tools and or, and or circuit engineers will decide whether the design can be built in the end. So if you're synthesizing your design, tools will uh, make sure that uh, uh, whether the design will be built or not, uh, or give you an answer, let's say. And if you actually are designing uh, the circuit uh, using via circuit engineers, or you're designing it yourself, you will design, you will decide if it can be built. Okay, so that's part of the uh, uh, verification. Let, let's talk about functional verification uh, because you're going to do a lot of that basically in the course. You're, you're actually hopefully doing that already. Basically, the goal is to check functional or logical correctness of this design. Well, you can also think about it as Boolean functionality, right? Does this circuit implement the Boolean 
function that it is supposed to implement. Uh, so in this verification, usually we ignore physical circuit timing like T set up T hold, because you don't want to mess, mix uh, concept, uh, things at the conceptual level. And this becomes uh, just a nuisance at that level. You may implement simple checks to catch obvious bugs if you want to, but we'll discuss timing verification later in this lecture as part five. There are two primary approaches to functional verification. One is logic simulation using test routines, for example, C, C++, Verilog, or you can use formal verification, as I said, using SAT solvers. We're not going to do SAT solving or formal verification, but we're going to do logic simulation in this course. Uh, and we're going to use Verilog for functional verification, and we're going to build test benches in Verilog to be able to do that. So let me introduce test bench based functional testing. Test bench is essentially a module that's created specifically to test a design. Uh, tested design is also called DUT or device under test. Uh, and the test bench looks like this at a high level. Basically, you have a test pattern generator, and there are multiple ways of generating test patterns, which are applied to inputs. And then you, uh, you observe the outputs at the end, and you check whether the outputs actually correspond to the correct outputs that you determine somehow, as we will see. Uh, so test bench provides inputs or test patterns to the design under test. And design under test could be either the entire system or it could be part of a system. It could be, for example, the sequential system that we showed earlier. Uh, the question is, how do you provide the test patterns to test the system? You can have test handcrafted values, or you can have automatically generated values, sequentially generated. You basically start with, let's, let's assume that you have three inputs. You enumerate all possible inputs, for example, right? Let's you have, if you have had 32 inputs, maybe you randomly test different inputs. That may, may or may, may not be a good idea. And the test band checks outputs of the design under test against handcrafted values, uh, golden outputs that you know to be correct, or compares it to the output of a golden design that's known to be absolutely correct or bug-free. We will see these differences between these two approaches in a little bit. So basically, a test bench can be a hardware description level, a language level code uh, written to test other HDL modules, or it could be a circuit schematic used to test other circuit designs. A uh, test bench is not designed for hardware synthesis. This is not something you synthesize. I mentioned this in the last lecture, but hopefully it's clear. Uh, it's, the goal is really to run it in simulation only to check whether the functionality of your circuit is correct. And you can do it in HDL simulation. You can do it in SPICE simulation. Uh, you can, um, essentially, you can do it at, an, at any level of simulation uh, that you are comfortable with, uh, if you would like. Uh, Test bench uses simulation only constructs also. For example, you can say, wait 10 nanoseconds. We discussed this in the last lecture very briefly. Uh, basically, you can basically apply these inputs at any time you want to uh, see the waveform and when it changes, for example, uh, so that you can actually um, test whether your uh, system is functionally correct under different delays, for example. Uh, and then you, you, we assume ideal voltage current source, of course, and this is not suitable to be uh, physically built. So let's take a look at common Verilog test bench types. Essentially, there are multiple. So there could be a simple test bench uh, where everything is done manually. Input output generation and error checking, results checking, let's say, uh, are uh, done manually. So there's a lot of work for the designer, but for small circuits, it might work. Self-checking uh, test bench, input output generation is manual, but error checking is automatic. So you automatically compare things. And automatic test bench is basically both input output generation and error checking are automatic. So let's take a look at uh, some of these. So we will walk through different types of test benches you may design uh, during your labs, for example, to test a module that implements a simple logic function, as you can see. It's very simple, right? And at the end, this is another silly function, another one of those silly functions. And this is its very log implementation. It's not the greatest implementation, as you can see, but uh, it's, it's, it's the most explicit implementation over here, as you can see. So we basically explicitly instantiate inverters, as well as gates, uh, the min term gates that uh, do the ends, and then we have the OR gate over here. So this is a very structural Verilog, as you can see. Uh, so we are going to use Verilog syntax for test benching. Essentially, uh, we have an initial block. It's like the always block, but runs only once at simulation start. So these are actually for simulation. These are Verilog constructs for simulation purposes. So we can set the value of a register to zero this way, and then use a blocking assignment, and then wait for 10 nanoseconds, do nothing, and then A becomes one. So this way you can simulate basically. And you can keep adding these things manually to your very log code, as you can see, so that you can decide when the inputs change. And then you can also display print messages, very similar to, to print, print based debugging, right? So let's take a look at our simple test bench. So we instantiate our silly function dot, 
And you saw the Verilog implementation of it earlier. And this is the test bench module, as you can see. And we have some registers and wires that are manually assigned. So this is going to be our manual test bench soon. And basically, we have an initial begin section. And then we apply hard code inputs one at a time. Initially, we apply A, zero, A, B, C, all zeros, and then wait for 10 nanoseconds. And then we change C to 1, wait for 10 nanoseconds. And then we change B to 1 and C to 0 to wait for 10 nanoseconds. And you keep doing this, basically. And at the waveform, you observe what the result is. Result is Y over here. And the, while you simulate the circuit, the silly function, uh, while, uh, by applying inputs consecutively at different times, now you can see in the waveform output changing, and you basically verify whether the output corresponds to the correct output given an input. Right? It's so simple, basically, from that perspective. So basically, most common method for output checking is looking at waveform diagrams, as I mentioned. Basically, you apply some inputs, and you get some output, and you check the output at the right times. Now, of course, uh, there are thousands of signals over millions of clock cycles. Uh, printf is not a great way of debugging. Waveform also may not be a great way of debugging if actually you have many, many outputs, for example, if you need to check a lot of things. So uh, manually checking that output is correct at all times is good. And it's good when you're learning, when you look at small circuits. But it doesn't work very well with very large circuits also. So pros, essentially, with the simple test bench, completely manual, it's easy to design. You can easily test a few specific inputs, for example, corner cases. But it's really not scalable to many test cases and large circuits also. And outputs must be checked manually outside of the simulation somehow. You can inspect dumped waveform signals. You can do printf style debugging. But none of them are really that scalable. So that brings us to the self-checking test bench, which is a little bit more uh, advanced, let's say. Basically, here, the key distinction is you apply the input. Uh, uh, OK, you apply the input, wait for some time. And then you check whether the output is correct. And then if the output is not correct, now you're encoding the outputs inside the test bench itself, as you can see. So the output is not one. You display, OK, this input failed. And then you apply another input. If the output is not as expected, you, have, you display it's failed. And you can do it in different ways, of course. You can do it via post-processing, et cetera. I'm not going to go through details. But again, this is still easy to design, still easy to test a few specific inputs, like corner cases. And simulator will print whenever an or error occurs, if you do it nicely. So output checking is automatic, if you will, over here. But still, it's not very scalable to millions of test cases. And again, easy to make an error in the hard-coded values that you see over here. Basically, you make just as many errors writing a test bench as actual code over here. So it's not clear if this sort of test bench uh, is really that scalable to very large circuits. And I don't think it is, actually. And it's hard to debug whether there's a, when you have an issue, when you have an output failing, for example, whether there's an issue with your original circuit or whether it's an issue with your test bench. So now your test bench may introduce errors also. This doesn't sound good, right? Uh, so we need to be careful. Uh, OK. Uh, so the next uh, issue, uh, way of doing self-checking test bench is using test vectors. So now you can write a test vector file. You can be more intelligent. You can say, OK, I want a file, list of inputs, and expected outputs. Now you can create vectors manually and automatically using an already verified simpler golden model. We'll see this later on. So this is one example vect uh, test vector file, for example. If for input, three inputs. 0, 0, 0, output should be 1. 0, 0, 1, output should be 0. And you keep doing this for eight inputs. So that's the format. So with small circuits, it's easy to write. With large circuits, it's also a bit easier to hard code in the very log again, right? Because now you're doing it in a methodical way in a file. Uh, and now you use a clock signal for assigning the inputs and reading outputs. Now you can actually automate this much better, right? Let's take a look at how this is done. Uh, so basically, uh, you, uh, you test one test vector each clock cycle. Don't confuse this clock cycle with the timing that we discussed earlier. This is just for testing. It has nothing to do with the clock cycle of, uh, uh, of the circuit itself. Basically, this is the clock cycle that we use for testing. At the rising edge of the clock, we apply the input. At the falling edge of the clock, we check the outputs because we're doing functional simulation, right? And then at the rising edge of the clock, we apply the next test vector. And at the falling edge of the clock, we check whether the output of the circuits and see whether it matches the golden output. That's the idea. So basically, the goal of this clock signal is to simply separate inputs from outputs. It allows us to observe the inputs outputs in waveform diagrams. It's not used for checking physical circuit timing. It has nothing to do with timing over here. The, the use of the clock is done uh, just for the purpose of testing over here. And later, we will discuss circuit timing verification briefly in this lecture uh, soon. But basically, this is an easier way of doing that testing. Uh, essentially, we have this test bench 3. Now we have test vectors. You can see we can have 10,000 of these test vectors. Uh, and we have different vector numbers and errors, bookkeeping variables over here. 
We instantiate the device under test. You can see a more uh, detailed example in H and H, as you can see. We generate a clock. And essentially, clock uh, clock is high for five nanoseconds, and then it's low for five nanoseconds, and it basically keeps repeating. Right? There's no sensitivity list, so it always executes. So forever, this clock keeps repeating, basically. Uh, and then this is what we do. Uh, it only the initial only executes once. It, you read the test vectors, and then basically do some reset, and then wait. And this is what you do before testing, basically. Always at the positive edge of clock, you apply uh, A, B, C to take the first three values of the test vectors and Y expected to be output, right? OK, basically apply A, B, C inputs on the rising edge of the clock. That's what the circuit does. So hopefully it's simple. And then you get Y expected for checking the output on the falling edge. And then rising and falling edges are chosen by convention over here. You can use any part of the clock signal if you wish. and the H and H textbook uses, uses the rising edge to apply the inputs and falling edge to check the outputs, basically. OK, this is your test bench, basically. This is the checking the outputs part, basically. If y is not equal to y expected, you get an error, basically. And then you basically keep, uh, 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 yeah, basically you get an error and you display the error. And then if test vectors, you reach the maximum, basically, you basically complete the test over here. So this is our test bench, basically. Over, over multiple slides, I showed you the test bench. This is the beginning of the test bench. This is how you generate the clock. This is how you read the file. This is how you apply each input in the text bench and uh, test bench and get the output. And then this is how you check the output at the negative edge of the clock over here, as you can see. So this is clearly much more scalable right, with uh, test vectors. It's easy to design, easy to test a few specific inputs, but more than that, probably. Simulator will print whenever an error occurs. And no, no need to change hard-coded values for different tests. You basically deal with a test vector file in this case. So it's a bit more scalable. But it may be error-prone depending on the source of the test vectors. It really depends on how you generate the test vectors over here. If you actually generate them hand, by hand, it's very error-prone. We will see how to generate them in a different way. It's more scalable, but still limited by reading a file. So you might have actually many more combinational paths to test them will fit in your memory. So this brings us to the automatic test bench, which is, in my opinion, the best way of testing. But for, this requires you to construct a golden model. So a golden model essentially represents the ideal circuit behavior, what the circuit is supposed to achieve. It must be developed independently and might, might be difficult to write. No question about that. It can be done in any language or even in Verilog. But you can do it in C, for example, whatever you're comfortable with at a high functional level. For example. For our example circuit earlier, this could be our golden very log model, right? behavioral model. It's a high level abstraction. Clearly, this is a silly function. So the golden model is simple, as you can see. But this is our golden model. It doesn't have a structural implementation. Basically, this is a functional implementation, which we hope is completely correct. Because it's simpler than our earlier gate level structural description, golden model is usually easier to design and understand. And they should be. Otherwise, your golden model is no, no better than your original design, right? And it must be easier to verify. So somebody needs to verify the golden model as well. OK, so this is important. So think about golden models all day. Now, how you design an automatic test bench becomes interesting, right? So the design under test output is compared against the golden model. So basically, you have a circuit simulating the golden model. <coughs> Sorry, you have a simulation simulating the golden model, as well as the design under test. And you apply the test patterns. It could, it could be generated the way, the way we discussed earlier to both the design under test and the golden model. And you basically compare the outputs. And if the outputs are equal, that's great. Design under test is golden. Of course, this requires that your golden model to be completely verified to be correct. Right? The challenge is uh, now there are two challenges, actually. One is golden model needs to be correct, as we discussed. And also, you still need to generate inputs to the designs. What do you do? Do you do sequential values to cover the entire input space? Do you test? Do you do random values? How do you actually select your inputs to apply? And this is actually a fundamental problem. No question about that. OK, let's take a look at the test bench code over here. It's now it becomes very simple. You have the silly function, inputs, and output. You have the golden model. Inputs are the same as the silly function. Output is different. And you basically have a test pattern generation that applies uh, the inputs to both circuits. And then if y, uh, the output of the design under test is not equal to the output of the golden model, then you basically have an error at the negative edge of the clock, as you can see. OK, so now it's fully automated, right? Output checking is fully automated. You can even compare timing using a golden timing model if you're aggressive enough. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, 
It's highly scalable to as much simulation time as is feasible, at least a high coverage of the input space, but we're going to talk about input space in a little bit. Now you have better separation of roles. You can separate designers uh, that work on the design under test and designers that work on the golden model, right? And the testing engineer can focus on the important test cases instead of output checking. Now you can actually really partition the work and independent people can actually do independent designs plus the testing. Of course, the cons is creating a correct golden model may be difficult, too very difficult. Sometimes maybe, I'm not going to say impossible, but uh, not so easy uh, to uh, compare to the complexity of the original model. And coming up with good testing inputs can still be difficult. And that's true for all of the testing mechanisms, right? Regardless of the automatic, uh, how automatic they are, testing inputs are a critical problem. Okay, now let's talk about testing inputs. Even with automatic testing, how long would it take to test a 32-bit adder? So a 32-bit adder has 64 inputs because you're adding A and B. Each, uh, each of A and B has 32 bits, so you have 64 bits. That's two to the 64 possible inputs. If you test one input in one nanosecond, you can test 10 to the nine inputs per second, or this many inputs per day, or this many inputs per year. Basically, you need 58.5 years to test all possibilities, which means that exhausting testing, testing or brute force testing of every single possible input is not feasible. That's why you need to be smart. You need to prune the overall testing space. You cannot do exhaustive testing, even for a 32-bit adder, as you can see. Uh, so you need to do uh, some sort of pruning of the testing space, choosing important cases, eliminating as much as possible the cases that do not matter. Uh, basically, there's a lot of work that is dedicated to designing test cases. Or you could, you could do a, a combination of formal verification and testing, et cetera. I'm not going to go into the details, but this is one of the reasons why verification is a hard problem. In addition to everything we discussed, in the end, you're really limited by the length the time to test. As a result, more than 70% 70, 70 of the design time of a cutting edge microprocessor is spent on testing. That's true for memory also. More than 70% of the time of memory, like DRAM, for example, is designed on verification and testing. Okay, let me quickly cover timing verification. We're not going to go into much detail on this and then we're going to conclude. Basically, there are multiple approaches to timing verification as well. You can do high level simulation, like Verilog, you can model timing using the statements that we saw in the design under test, like the timing statements. You, it's useful for hierarchical modeling, clearly, to high-level simulation. You can insert delays and flip-flops, gates, memories, anything basically you want, including wires, actually, as we saw earlier. And high-level design will have some notion of timing in this case. But usually, it's not as accurate as real circuit timing, because you may say, OK, this flip-flop is going to take five nanoseconds clock to queue, but it may not, right? It may take much longer or shorter. So uh, the other approach that's more accurate is the circuit level timing verification. For this, you need to first synthesize your design to actual circuits. Basically, you have to go through high level synthesis or whatever you do to actually create an actual level circuit uh, into your FPGA or ASIC, et cetera, uh, or, or some low level design netlist, let's say. Uh, and there's no one general approach over here. It's very design flow specific. Your FPGA or ASIC technology uh, may have special tools for this. Usually they do. Like Vivado has some tools for this, assuming some backend uh, that you compile into. Uh, but of course, real industry level tools, industrial grade tools are actually very much sophisticated, especially for VLSI design, for example. If you're really interested in this, you may take a VLSI design class. We have very good VLSI design class at ETH, for example. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting things that you can do over here, but it's very low level as you can see also. The good news is tools that you use will usually try to beat the timing for you. If you say, okay, I want this clock frequency. These are my setup times, hold times. Uh, and this is the expected clock skew or whatever. Uh, it will try to meet the timing. But unfortunately, they may not always meet the timing. They usually provide some sort of timing report, timing summary. Uh, they give you worst case delay paths as much as they can discover them. Maximum operation frequency they expect. Any timing errors that, that were found, they may be conservative in these. Uh, these tools are not exhaustively exploring the space because exhaustively exploring space actually takes years, as we saw. Uh, so they may give you some idea of your timing. Uh, and you may go back and fix your timing based on these tools, but you always need to be careful about how much you rely on the tools. And the bad news is the tool can fail to find a solution sometimes, so you're back to square one. Uh, desired clock frequency may be too aggressive. As a result, uh, you may have a setup time violation of a particular long path. The tool may be able to report that potentially. That's good. But still, it may not be able to find it. So you may actually go, need to go back and modify the circuit. You may have too much logic on clock paths. 
which may lead to uh, excessive clock skew. You may need to go back and fix your clock distribution paths. You may have timing issues with asynchronous logic, which we did not cover, so don't worry about it at this point. Basically, the tool will hopefully provide you helpful errors. That's the key expectation. Uh, with VR reports that will contain paths that fail to meet the timing. And it enables you to have a place from where you can start debugging. But unfortunately, as I said, these are not perfect. And don't rely on the perfectness of the tools as a designer. So you need to really know how your design well, and you need to really have a good understanding of timing if you really want to design a circuit that's really uh, very, very aggressive in terms of timing. And we didn't even talk about power, right? If we could even have a full lecture on power in a similar way, but I'm not going to do that clearly. OK, basically, you may need to fix your timing errors. And uh, to fix the timing errors, we already discussed this, actually. Usually, fixing the timing errors is a manual and iterative process, basically. You need to meet the, meet the strict timing constraints. And this could be tedious. You need to figure out where the problem is. The tool may point you to some direction that you need to go and fix what, that, what the problem in that direction is. Uh, you can later fix the problem, try synthesis and place on route with different options using the tool, different seeds, because tool, again, it does a random exploration. Usually, sometimes they could do, for example, Monte Carlo simulations, et cetera. Uh, uh, as a result, they don't fully explore the space. So you may actually try to also guide the tool to actually explore some different space than it has explored previously. But again, no guarantees here. You're at the mercy of the tool. If you don't, especially if you don't know what you're doing, you're at the mercy of the tool. OK, and then you can also manually provide hints, for example, to the tool. But now it becomes very, very tedious, right? And finally, you can, you, I think uh, you can manually optimize the reported problem paths. This is not a bad thing. You can simplify complicated logic, split up comp long combination logic paths. That's always a good thing in general. And, uh, but the difficulty is fixing whole time violations is difficult, as we discussed earlier. So meeting timing constraints is uh, essentially not, not an easy art and science in the end, because the tools are not perfect, and humans are not perfect. And there are many ways of actually designing a circuit, as I showed you. Even the 4 to 1 multiplexer, we saw three ways, for example, early on. And they all have different timings, as we discussed, right? OK, so let's go back to the fundamental principles over here. Clock cycle time is determined by the maximum logic delay we can accommodate without violating timing constraints. So hopefully, that is clear. So good design principles help you in general. So in general, it's good to follow good logic design and architectural design principles. I'm going to talk about these, and I may actually introduce some later when we talk about microarchitecture. Uh, we're taking a little bit more time than expected, but that's OK. I think you can watch this lecture later on. And these are, as I already said, this is not going to be on the exam anyway, if, if, you're, if that's what you're worried about. But these good design principles are really important uh, for, uh, in general, I think, when you're doing any kind of design. Uh, so basically, one important design principle is critical path design. You really want to minimize the maximum logic delay as much as possible without wasting things. This maximizes performance. Right? And then you can decide, OK, whether I really want this or not. That's a separate issue. But critical path design is a good idea so that you maximize your performance as much as possible. Balanced design is another design principle. The, the idea here is to balance the maximum logic delays across different parts of a system. For example, different, between different pairs of flip-flops, you have this two flip-flops, and you have some combination logic. And you have another set of two flip-flops, and you have some combination logic. A balanced design balances the maximum logic delay across all of these different parts so that none of them is really a big critical path. And to be able to do that, you have no, uh, basically, this, create, this ensures that there are no bottlenecks. And it also minimizes the wasted time in any path in general. So balanced design is actually good for efficiency as well as uh, not having bottlenecks in your system. And the last part is bread and butter design, uh, as, I, as we like calling it. And the idea is to optimize for the common case, but make sure that the non-common cases do not overwhelm the design. So uh, for example, if you have a common input that's going to be applied to your sequential circuit, maybe you should really optimize that path. Because if, if you know your circuit, for example, if you know that some input combination never happens for whatever reason, then you can say, oh, this, I'm, I'm going to guarantee that this input combination never happens. And you can eliminate that from the consideration of the timing, for example. And you can optimize your circuit with that in mind. And this may actually now maximize your performance for the realistic cases, right? And this is really the common case design. And you may handle the non-common case in some other way. This will become more clear when we talk about microarchitecture two weeks from now as well. But if you actually follow these good design principles, uh, you, this, these also help with meeting the timing constraints in a global level in your entire system. And also, 
by minimizing your critical paths. OK, uh, we talked about a lot of interesting things, but hopefully uh, you learned a lot about timing. Uh, just to recap, we talked about timing in combinational circuits, sequential circuits, and circuit verification. The last part of the course was really about functional verification mostly. And we did talk about timing verification a little bit, but timing verification is really, uh, we didn't really go into as much detail in, in terms of the testing of the timings and verification. With that, I think we have now uh, covered uh, the timing lectures of, uh, over timing and verification lecture. And with this also, we have covered essentially the digital design uh, part of the course. Remember, this course is really digital design and computer architecture. Uh, so it's a broad course that covers digital design and computer architecture, and we're done with the digital design part. Next week, we're going to start with the computer architecture part, which is really the instruction set architecture and von Neumann model.